Good afternoon. We're happy that each of you are with us today. We have a seminar lined up for you that I know you will enjoy. In fact, we're going to be talking about laity or laymen and the three angels' messages. And we have a presenter with us that has a lot of experience in um, supporting ministries. And right now he is the IT manager at Heritage Academy, Charles Saar, somebody that I've known for many years. And uh, we share uh, some common interests in music and many other things. And we're delighted to have him here today. Thank you for being with us. We look forward to your presentation and I just wanna welcome you. Thank you, Wayne. It's good to be with you this afternoon and uh, to be a part of this special interest track for OCI. Um, what I'm hoping to do today is to, uh, I love technology. Somehow it looks like I have just managed to share the wrong screen. <laughs> Sorry about that. No problem. We'll try screen sharing again. And maybe while you take a look at that, I'll just say that you can interact with us on this seminar today. And you'll notice on the right hand side, there's two things there. There's the chat window and there's also a poll link that you can click on right beside each other. And we're going to be using both of them this afternoon. So feel free to enter any questions in the chat box or comments as well are welcome. And you can also, once it's time to run the polls, uh, we will run those on that other link and you can uh, participate by answering those poll questions and then we'll look at the results together. I wish it was true that IT managers had no IT problems, but occasionally <laughs> we do have a challenge. Today I'm going to try and share with you uh, three threads of thought and hopefully by the time we get done with this, we'll be able to tie those three threads together to some benefit for all of us. But before we go any further, I would like to ask that you would please pause with me for a word of prayer. Father in heaven, we are gathered as your people together here to try and, and be better servants for you. And you've chosen an unprofitable servant to bring the riches of your truths and so I'm asking that you will somehow be seen above all that is said and that is done today. Thank you for the presence of your spirit, for we're asking for him now in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so first poll right off the beginning here. I have a question I'd like to ask before we jump into the first of our threads, and that's to take a quick inventory of how you relate to the word fear. Do you consider fear to be significantly anxiety, awe, dread, respect, or terror? And if you would pop over to the, to the poll there and just give an indication of what you can relate to most significantly there, fear, awe, dread, respect, or terror. And I'm going to go ahead with the presentation while you have a few minutes to respond to that thought. Now this is titled Laity and the Three Angels Message. And I thought that it would be appropriate for us to start in the Three Angels Messages. That's in Revelation 14. And from the New American Standard Translation, we have this. And I saw another angel flying in mid heaven, having an eternal gospel to preach to those who live on the earth to every nation and tribe and tongue and people. And he said with a loud voice, fear God and give, glory, give him glory because the hour of his judgment has come. Worship him who made heaven and earth and the sea and the springs of waters. And as I was reading this in my own personal devotions, I took a look at that word fear. Now I'm, I'm not claiming to be a Bible scholar, but I can make my way around a strong concordance. And so I looked up that word fear and I discovered that as I looked at the meaning for this word, it typically means to put to flight or to terrify or to frighten. It's the Greek word phobio. We get from that our, our phobias, our fears. But it is also translated as awestruck, respects, and terrified. 
And I was really taken with that translation of awestruck. And I, I thought, where is this translated as awestruck? It's not here in Revelation 14, but it is translated as awestruck in Matthew 9. And let's take a quick look there in Matthew 9. I think, there we go. You know the story is that of the paralytic. And the story starts in verse 2, but I'm going to skip down to verse 6 and pick it up there. But so that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. Then he said to the paralytic, get up, pick up your bed, and go home. And he got up and went home. But when the crowd saw this, they were awestruck. That's phobio awestruck and glorified God who had given such authority to men. So what makes the difference between an anxious response and an awestruck response? I can't be a, an authority here, but I'm going to give you an opinion. There is no consideration of self in awe. Fear, as we generally think of it, is a self-focused response. It's a response of concern or trepidation regarding one's own well-being or the well-being of someone close to you. When we remove that factor of self, we're left with awe. And here you actually have Revelation's first angel's message formula right here in Matthew 9. That they fearful and glorified God or they were awestruck and glorified God. And I thought, you know, there is absolutely nothing in our understanding of God that should leave us fearful. And so I'm, I'm in my own experience seeking more and more now to when I consider God to be awestruck by him. So there's our first thread. And we're going to move on to thread number two and to our poll number two. Let's see. Uh, awe, outrage, terror in our poll, I see. And we're going to move on to our next poll. And in this next poll, I'd like to ask you this, because we're starting a whole other thread of thought here. We'll tie them back later. If you could be granted one gift in anticipation of ministry, similar to Solomon, what gift would you prefer? Would you prefer land and buildings? Would you prefer money and resources? Would you prefer personnel and mentorship? How about poverty and hardship or schooling and education? We're going to uh, let you skip over to that or, or be processing that poll as our host puts that up for us. Um, Maybe your connection's a little better than my connection because I'm not seeing the new poll yet. But if you could be granted one of those gifts, I'll let you respond to that poll as I move ahead. It was probably 1990 or 1991. And I had just transitioned from the business world to supporting ministry work. I guess you could say that I'd made my own exodus from the city and had, I had just asked Mr. Bob Zollinger, he was the president of the school where I was working and and somewhat of a patriarch within Adventist supporting ministries. And I asked him, is there a place in this late stage of Earth's history for starting new ministries similar to Laurelbrook, the one where I was working? And as a good educator, Mr. Bob didn't give me a short direct answer like yes or no. Instead, he shared something with me. He shared with me, there are three things that you need for a place like Laurelbrook to succeed. You need a, a place where you can operate. And there are places all over the world where that could be true. You need a viable industry or source of cash flow that is suitable to that location. And that is true in just about any of those locations. And then you need dedicated people committed to what you're trying to do. He paused for a moment and he added the first two are relatively easy. So what is that best preparation for ministry? I don't think you'd be attending this seminar if you weren't in some degree interested in that question. And I'd like to share with you a passage that I found in the Ministry of Healing. And I'm going to apologize in advance because I'm going to be reading a little bit of text context, a couple of paragraphs here. I promise not to do that often. 
Jesus came to this earth to accomplish the greatest work ever accomplished among men. What were the conditions chosen by the infinite father for his son? A secluded home in the Galilean hills, a household sustained by honest, self-respecting labor, a life of simplicity, daily conflict with difficulty and hardship, self-sacrifice, economy, patient, gladsome service, the hour of study at his mother's side with the open scroll of scripture, quiet of dawn or twilight in the green valley, the holy ministries of nature, the study of creation and providence, and the soul's communion with God. These were the conditions and opportunities of the early life of Jesus. So it is with the great majority of the best and noblest men of all ages. Read the story of Abraham, Jacob, Joseph, Moses, David, Elisha. Study the lives of men of later times who have most worthily filled positions of trust and responsibility. The men whose influence has been most effective for the world's uplifting. How many of these were reared in country homes? They knew little of luxury. They did not spend their youth in amusement. They were forced to struggle with poverty and hardship. They early learned to work and their active life in the open air gave vigor and elasticity to all of their faculties. Forced to depend upon their own resources, they learned to combat difficulties and to surmount obstacles and they gained courage and perseverance. They learned the lessons of self-reliance and self-control. Sheltered in a great degree from evil associations, they were satisfied with natural pleasures and wholesome companionships. They were simple in their tastes and temperate in their habits. They were governed by principle and they grew up pure and strong and true. And when called to their life work, they brought to it physical and mental power, buoyancy of spirit, ability to plan and execute, and steadfastness in resisting evil that made them a positive power for good in the world. So what were the key points here? A country home, poverty and hardship, work, open air, difficulties and obstacles. And what were the results of these? Courage, perseverance, self-reliance, self-control, natural pleasures, wholesome companionships, simplicity, Temperance, governed by principle, pure, strong, true. And the results, physical and mental power, buoyancy of spirit, and the ability to plan and execute steadfastness in resisting evil. The result, a positive good power for good in the world. And we're going to see all of these characteristic traits again as we slip on into our third thread of thought. The subtitle for this seminar was, as it was given to me, a, a history of supporting work. And there's no way for us to look at the history of supporting work without looking at the life of E.A. Sutherland. And to other, understand Edward Sutherland, we're going to have to go back in his family history just a little bit. His grandfather was educated in Scotland for the Presbyterian ministry and he moved first to Canada and then to Wisconsin, where his family settled in on a farm. But he wasn't much of a farmer, and the support of the family of 12 pretty much fell to his wife, a fact that seems to have been something of a point of contention for one of his sons, Joseph in particular. Well, the Sutherland farm wasn't too far from the farm of the Rankin family. The Rankins had accepted Sabbath-keeping Adventism. They also had eight red-headed daughters, and Joseph Sutherland married the old, oldest, Mary Rankin. They decided to take a journey to Iowa to create an independent future for themselves, and they were hoping to arrive there before the baby came. Sounds like a different Joseph and Mary, doesn't it? They only got as far as the Mississippi River at Prairie du Chien, and before their caravan was able to cross the river, Edward Alexander was born on March 3. 1865. Edward learned early the value of labor and patience that farm life teaches. He herded cows with his sister for a penny a day between them. And that summer, he managed to net a total of 35 cents. He hung on to that 35 cents all winter long, and at his father's suggestion, he put it into onion sets in the spring. 
He planted and tended those onions and he sold the crop for a tidy profit. And this was his first business venture. Well, he was just graduated from high school. When he went to teach in a nearby country school, he rode on his pony mouse back and forth to school. And then in the summer after that year of teaching, he went to Call Porter in Minnesota, staying in the home of Josephine Gotzian. Mrs. Gotzian had been a patient at Battle Creek where she had accepted the Adventist faith and she was recently widowed and quite well-to-do. And she was also very frugal. In fact, Ed got up early every day to go some distance across town so that they could get milk for just a little bit less than it could be obtained close by. He helped her around the house, cared for her carriage horse, in addition to doing his cup ordering. And he made a good impression on her. And he wouldn't be able to know at this point how this unusual friendship would be, would affect his future. And Mrs. Gotzian became a close friend of Ellen White and a significant source of capital for many ministry endeavors. Well, that summer, Edward discovered that John Harley, Harvey Kellogg was recruiting young men for a pre-medical course to be taught at Battle Creek. And he determined he was gonna join that program. Even though he was met with quite a bit of resistance from his family, particularly his father who saw absolutely no need for him to get any further education. Well, Edward sold his pony mouse. That gave him the funds to be able to go to Battle Creek. And he arrived only to find out that the program he'd signed up for had been canceled due to lack of students. Only one other individual had responded. But since he was there at the college, he decided to take advantage of the resources that were there. His year of teaching had pointed out some deficiencies that he had. And so he began to study English privately with Professor Goodlow Bell. Now, Professor Bell had a little bit different view of education than most people around him. And that view had its effect on Edward. For instance, Professor Bell felt that the Bible should be the centerpiece of education, that other subjects should be taught in, re in relationship to Bible principles. He also thought that one half of the day should be spent in intellectual pursuits and the other half should be spent in physical labor. At the end of the year, Edward went back home and he taught for two more years. Now, in spite of his family's disapproval of his pursuit of college, Edward was determined to help his father on the farm. His muscles were soft, the work was hard, and so was his father. His father, against the protests of his mother and the other farmhands, asked Edward to be the straw monkey. Now, if you're not used to putting up a harvest, you may not be familiar with that, but it's considered the hardest job in the harvest. Well, Edward sang and prayed his way through that harvest season, and he did it without complaint. And when the season was over, his father commented, well, I guess you have got the right stuff. You can go on to school if you'd like. So Edward is going to be able to get back to school, but we want to take a quick break here for the third of our polls. Which of the Ministry of Healing traits do you think might have been most influential in Edward's development up to this point? You think it's the country home, the poverty and the hardship, the hard work, maybe the open air. How about the difficulties and the obstacles? We'll give you some time to respond to those uh, options in the poll as we move forward with our presentation. Edward returned to Battle Creek. And this time he did it with his father's blessing. While he was there, he also came to the attention of W.W. Prescott. Now, W.W. Prescott was the president of the college. And this was going to be another relationship that was destined to flourish. Prescott became a mentor to Edward and a champion of the reforms that Edward would be bringing to Adventist education. At the beginning of his junior year, 1888, he befriended a new arrival at the college. His name was Percy McGann. He was from Ireland. Percy had been invited to live for a time with Ellen White. And Percy and Edward began to spend considerable time that year at the home of Mother White, as they came to call her. Percy was 19. Edward was 23. 
And at this point in time, Ellen was now widowed and about 61. It was no accident that placed Edward and Percy and Mother White together that fall of 1888. You might recall that this is also the time that Jones and Wagner were sharing their renewed emphasis on righteousness by faith. Mother White referred to the teaching as the third angel's message in verity. Percy attended the meetings, but Edward did not. Though younger than Edward, Percy taught Edward many things. Ed, Ed soon discovered that Percy enjoyed a religious experience that he didn't know. And Percy had already yielded his life entirely to God's leading and accepted this message of righteousness by faith in Jesus without question and without reservation. Little by little, Percy would lead Edward to that same experience. Through the winter, the boys observed Mother White. They marked her self-sacrificing life, her simple home, her peace and joy that, that just seemed to spill over to everyone in the household. They came to know her standards for living and her selfless concern for the growing work. Percy began working in the college bakery, and it wasn't long before he was the head baker. And in his spare time, he worked in the machine shop and learned to be proficient with tools. In Ed's spare time, he played football and baseball. One day, Ed took a hold of Percy's arm and said, we need another man on our baseball team, a man with this kind of muscle. Not interested. But why? Percy responded, I can't regard any activity as recreation suitable to me unless it confers benefit on somebody else. Well, Edward pondered his friend's response and his example for some time, coming eventually to believe, as his friend did, about true recreation. During Edward's senior year at Battle Creek, Percy, at Mother White's recommendation, was engaged in a round the world trip as the secretary and traveling companion of Elder S.N. Haskell. He was moving around the world looking for strategic locations in which to place mission stations. Elder Haskell was also a devout Christian and a staunch advocate of the spirit of prophecy given to Mother White. Lacking the close companionship of Percy that year, Edward took notice of a certain young lady who was also from Iowa. Her name was Sally Brodiar. She was talented and educated in languages and artist. She had a sterling character and they both wanted to teach. Although the rules of the college restricted association between men and women students, before graduation, the faculty gave their permission for the couple to pursue a relationship and they were married toward the end of the summer after graduation. They had accepted a position at the Minneapolis Academy where Edward would be the principal of about 100 students, many of them as old as themselves. And this couple grew to be a powerful education team. On his return to Battle Creek, Percy, now 21, was asked to interrupt his studies to fill an urgent need for a history teacher. Well, he studied well beyond the requirements of his history course, particularly studying Mother White's Council on Education Reform. By the time he'd finished teaching his first year, he was committed to several of the basic principles of reform that would champion for the rest of his life. It would also appear that there had been a significant change in Edward's father toward education. In Edward's senior year, his father moved the entire family to Battle Creek. Two years later, when Union College was being organized, Joseph Sutherland accepted the position of business manager at the new institution and allowed his daughter to enroll. Edward and Sally were also invited to work at the new school in Nebraska. And so they packed up their things and they moved to Union College. Barely having arrived and only partially unpacked, they turned around and headed with Percy to Harbor Springs, Michigan for a teacher's convention that was being held there. There were some 80 Adventist teachers along with others who were gathering for six weeks of study into the counsel that Mother White had been giving on education. Percy and Edward were once again together and quickly renewed their friendship. Edward shared uh, his meeting of Sally and of his successful year at the Minneapolis Academy. Percy told of his tour with Elder Haskell and the year of teaching at Battle Creek. Mother White was also at the meeting speaking a total of six times on the subjects of righteousness by faith and the principles of Christian education. 
Edward was faced with several important decisions that summer. This was the summer that he met his crisis of belief in righteousness by faith. It was also when his attitude toward the testimonies shifted to believing that the spirit of prophecy counsels from Mother White applied to him personally. You see, most Adventists at this time considered the testimonies to be simply personal messages, not general counsel. According to Edward, they would, and I'm quoting him, read them, put them back on the shelf and say to themselves, oh, I'm sure glad they didn't write that to me. Well, Edward later recalled, there came to me an acid test. Do you believe in righteousness by faith? Are you forgiven because Christ's offer has been accepted? Or do you seek to attain righteousness by your own works? Edward finally accepted the messages as having a general application. And it was a conviction that he held great import for the rest of his life. The boys learned to value the marvelous gift to the remnant church that God had bestowed on this gentle woman. The conviction that the revelations came directly from God struck deep in their hearts and shaped all of their future actions. Edwards saw Christian education in an entirely new light, including a new understanding of Mother White's counsels on practical education, and Percy talked him out of his lingering desire to become a doctor, pursuing instead teaching as a life work. Edward confided in Percy during this time that he'd like to move south to establish a work as Mother White had been encouraging people to do. And Percy, with his typical wisdom beyond his years, responded, if we are willing, I think God will open the way for us to work where he needs us most. Well, where he needs us most was not long in revealing itself. Before the end of the conference, Edward announced to Sally that they'd been asked to go to Battle Creek to teach. He to teach history and she to teach art. They went back to Union College, repacked their things, and moved to Battle Creek. Just before classes were to start, the president informed Edward that he would not be teaching history, but rather would be teaching Old Testament Bible. Well, Edward thought that Genesis would be a good place to start in the Old Testament, and it wasn't very far into that book before he and his students were discussing God's original plan for diet. Soon the students were petitioning for a vegetarian option in the cafeteria. And within two years, the campus had gone vegetarian. Edward's stand on this topic brought him to the attention of general conference leadership. After only one year at Battle Creek, Ed was asked to be the principal at a new college in Walla Walla, Washington. The president of the college lived in Michigan. So for practical purposes, it was up to Edward to get the school ready for operation that first year. In his first five months, he needed to attend camp meeting, create a curriculum for the college, produce a catalog, find and hire qualified teachers, recruit students, and oversee the construction workers who were building the school building. But on opening day, December 7, 1892, there were 91 students and 10 teachers ready to start school. By the end of the school year, enrollment was over 160. And by way of comparison, the University of Washington that year, which had been in operation for 30 years now, had an enrollment of only 42 students. Things were a bit rough. The building was not finished when school opened. Construction progressed only as funds were available. Edward was serious about avoiding debt. The only heat in the building was from two stoves. One was a potbelly stove in the chapel. The other was a borrowed range in the kitchen. And it turned out it didn't work when they first tried to fire it up. So the first meal in the cafeteria was white crackers and milk. And the cafeteria was the first in the denomination to be all vegetarian. There was only one bathroom and one tub in each dorm. The staff wrote to the general conference describing the situation and asking for help. And they came back and reply with detailed instructions on how you could take a bath in a basin of water. The school promptly purchased basins for all the dorm rooms. The second year, Edward was leading Walla Walla and given the title of president. There was also a new staff member, Bessie DeGraw. She interrupted her studies at Battle Creek, similar to what Pe Percy had done a few years earlier and she traveled to Walla Walla so she could help out. 
she came on the condition that she would not be asked to be preceptress. Oh, we don't use that term much these days. It's something akin to a dorm dean. And upon her arrival, Edward promptly asked her to be the preceptress, in addition to teaching history. She acquiesced. And Bessie proved to be a dynamo that would wind up working with Edward for the rest of his life and hers. When Walla Walla was purchased, they had more than 350 acres of land. But by the time Edward got there, they only had 10 acres remaining. The rest had been sold off to provide funds for construction. Ed and Sally kept the land situation as a matter of ongoing prayer. Economic times were challenging. The farmers that had bought some of the land from the school couldn't pay their loans. And Edward took the opportunity to buy back 60 acres that the school could use to run a farm consistent with Mother White's counsel. For some time, Mother White's counsels have been repeatedly emphasizing a number of themes that the ancient school of the prophets should be the model that we emulate, that the science of salvation is the greatest of sciences, that fictitious and infidel books should be avoided, that agriculture and mechanical arts should be taught in every school, that the study of the Bible is of redemptive importance and to be emphasized above all other studies, and that students must be helped to be thinkers, able to reason from cause to effect. Edward was very intentional about educating his staff in these councils. He held staff retreats where they would study the testimonies on Christian education that were coming from Mother White. She was in Australia at this time, helping with the starting of Avondale. The testimonies were a constant topic of conversation all over campus. And the fundamental question with each matter with council was, what will that look like here on our campus? How will we implement this principle? Well, in February of 1897, Edward had been at Walla Walla for a little more than four years. And he made a presentation of what was happening at the college to the general conference session. The conference also heard reports from Union College and Battle Creek College, both of which were experiencing some significant declines Battle Creek was struggling at the time under a significant debt of over $90,000. That'd be more than two and a half million in today's currency. Clearly God had been blessing young Edwards leadership at Walla Walla and the church voted to move that leadership and the reforms that were being implemented to its flagship institution, Battle Creek. At the age of 32, Edward, along with Sally and Bessie, joined Percy back at Battle Creek for the next school year. But Edwards was about to find out that reform is not so easily implemented in an established program as it is in a new one. So here's another poll. Which of those Ministry of Healing traits do you think might have been most useful to Edwards' experience so far? You think maybe it was perseverance? Self-reliance, wholesome companionships, simplicity, maybe being governed by principle. We're going to give you a few minutes to respond to that poll as we move ahead with our story of Ed Sutherland. Battle Creek was located on only seven acres in the middle of the city. Ed and Percy desperately wanted to move the school out to the country and comply with the principles that Mother White had been sharing. But the personal counsel from Mother White was, wait. So while they waited, they did what they could. Percy started a debt relief organization and began publishing a paper called The Advocate on Educational Reform. Edward wrote a sizable book on educational history called Broken Cisterns and Living Fountains. And as a result, the teachers came firmly behind the concept of discontinuing degrees. Edward and Percy plowed up the tennis court and the baseball field for garden space. Not too long after that, someone donated the money for an 80 acre farm. Of course, the farm was a ways away from the college, but at least some students would be able to work there and earn their way, at least part of it. And the food that was produced on the 30 acres of orchards and 50 acres of farmland and gardens 
helped in the operation of the school. There was a great deal of opposition among students, but there was also a great deal of support. In fact, a revival swept through the campus. There were some notable people also who stood firmly with Edward and Percy on the side of reform. Among them, Dr. John Harvey Kellogg, director of the sanitarium, and the chairman of the board, Alonzo T. Jones. This would prove to be encouraging for now, but problematic in the years to come, as we're going to see. Well, Edward was also receiving strong support and counsel from W.W. Prescott, his mentor for over a decade, and the former president of Battle Creek, who had turned into the General Conference Educational Secretary. Prescott had organized the Harbor Springs meeting, and he was firmly behind the educational reforms and the councils of Mother White. Edward was also getting letters from several churches requesting teachers for their children. Mother White was penning that a school should be established anywhere there were no more than six children. And that fall, Battle Creek had started a normal program. That's a program for training teachers. But the requests couldn't wait. Edward went to the chapel meeting with the students with the three letters of request and asked if there might be someone willing to interrupt their studies to meet the needs of these families. Nobody responded. So the second day he made the same inquiry and first one and then two more young ladies stood up. By Christmas, there were seven schools in operation with students volunteering to interrupt their studies. By March, there were 13. And during the next school year, 57 schools were organized by the fall of 2000, two years later, almost 150 schools were in operation. Edward and Percy were actively working on the college debt that they had inherited from prior administrations. In the spring of 1900, Mother White dedicated the royalties of Christ object lessons to the relief of the schools and $57,000 worth were sold in the first year in America. The Battle Creek students had also raised $6,000 the year before towards debt retirement. Ed and Percy began to make secret trips into the country to locate a farm where they could move the school. They found three farms adjacent to one another for sale, totaling 274 acres. Mother White at this time was making plans to retire in Australia, but messages were still coming to America from her inspired pen. And for the moment, the counsel to her boys regarding a move was still wait, but then, Mother White unexpectedly announced her return to America from Australia. She determined that she was going to be there in time for the February 1901 General Conference, in part because God had revealed to her some things that, about problems that needed to be firmly met. She spoke to the General Conference on several subjects. Among them was the relocation of the school. And after her comments on that subject, the General Conference Committee met and voted to purchase some rural property to which they could move the college. Mother White approved of the description of the farms that had been found. The next school year, the, the campus was not ready, so they started school in Berrien Springs, Michigan. They started with a new name. It was Emanuel Missionary College, and since there were no significant buildings on campus, they used the space that they could find, which in this case was the courthouse and jail that had recently been vacated since the county seat had moved to St. Joe. They were building several small buildings on the new property. You might think of these as small cottages. They became married student housing. There was something like efficiencies, very efficient, since they had no electricity and no source of heat. After all, these were the conditions that the students were going to find when they went into mission service. Percy's wife, Ida, gave her inheritance to help starting, start the construction on campus. And as at Walla Walla, the buildings were only built as the funds were available. So Ed has successfully overseen the transfer of the school to a new campus. Which of these Ministry of Healing traits has particularly resonated with you as you've seen them in Edward's experience. 
Do you see your experience being one of courage? Maybe perseverance or self-control? Temperance? Maybe being governed by principle. Which of these do you think may have helped you so far in your experience of pursuing ministry? We'll let that poll unwind for a couple of more minutes as we move on with our story. Progress on the new campus was obvious and it was rapid, but opposition to the educational reforms continued to run strong. Enrollment had dropped as, as had been predicted and Ed's friendships with Dr. Kellogg and A.T. Jones had been helpful for a while, but those men were falling out of favor with the church leadership for other reasons and on other issues. And so those friendships were no longer assets. With Mother White's support, Ed did narrowly avoid being fired by the board. And Percy's wife, Ida, always somewhat of a delicate constitution, took ill in part from her stress over the criticism that her husband was receiving. She died during the Union Conference in May of 1904, leaving Percy with two small children. Percy and Edward had had enough. They tendered their resignations to head south. And before school was out, Ed had, was meeting with Mother White on Edson White's paddle wheel floating evangelistic center called the Morning Star. They started up river to pick up Percy, but they had mechanical problems along the way. Ed recognized the place as Neely's Bend near Larkin Springs. Mother White wished to see a farm that was nearby. Ed had already seen it and he wasn't interested in it, but he agreed to accompany Mother White. The place looked worse than he'd remembered, but Mother White seemed enamored with it. It, it looks like a place I've seen in visions, he said. Ed's heart sank. No sooner had they picked up Percy than Mother White called Ed and Percy to her cabin. Well, Brother McGann, I saw your farm today and I walked all around it. And I'm convinced that God wants you and Ed Sutherland to have that place. It's the kind of place that's been shown to me in vision. What do you think of it? I think of it as little as I can. It's all run down and we don't have the money. Well, I'm sorry, because it seems to me that the Lord intends that you shall have that place. A few days later, Ed and Percy returned to the farm. Ed shared with Percy, I wish there was some honorable and Christian way to get out of this whole thing without showing a lack of faith in the testimonies from the Lord's messenger. And they wrestled with this decision for the rest of the day. Before Percy, before the day was over, Percy summed it up. Ed, we're in it, in it voluntarily. And Mrs. White is with us. God is leading us. and He will show us the way. They shared their decision with Mother White. She showed great pleasure. I'll do anything I can to help you. Tell your story to the people. They will help. I'll recommend your work. And I'll come on your board if you wish. Now, this last statement bore great significance. It was the only board that she ever served on, and she served on it until the year before she died. Well, Ed headed north to consult with his Aunt Nell Drillard, his mother's sister, and a fiery redhead known by most as Mother D. Most importantly, she was a keen businesswoman. She thought this idea was harebrained. But noting his determination to follow Mother White's counsel, she agreed to accompany Ed back to Nashville by train. A welcoming party met them at the station that included Mother White. When they heard that the price had been raised $1,000, Mother D said, I'm glad we're not going to take it. And Mother White replied, glad? Glad? You think I'd let the devil beat me out of the place for $1,000? Pay the $1,000. It's cheap enough. She then turned to Mother D and she said, Nell, you think that you are almost old enough to retire, but if you will cast in your lot with this work, if you'll look after these boys, guide them and support them and what the Lord wants them to do, 
then the Lord will renew your youth and you will do more in the future than you have ever done in the past. Immediately, McGann, Sutherland, and Mother D drove the nine miles out to the Ferguson farm to meet with Miss Sally and her husband. The documents needed to be signed in front of a notary. So they took Miss Sally and her husband the nine miles back into Nashville where Miss Sally waffled on the decision. She couldn't decide whether she should assign the agreement or not. She finally grabbed a pen and signed and McGann handed her the down payment check and the boys took the papers and left quickly. Mother White later said, you boys will never know how many angels it took to help you get that. Well, the Fergusons didn't vacate the property immediately. People had to stay wherever they could. The servants' quarters above the carriage house were called Probation Hall. If you could endure its rigors, you could handle anything Madison had to offer. And until the Fergusons left, the downstairs housed servants and mules and horses and some smoked hams along with rats and flies and fleas and vermin. Well, the place was cleaned up and Eventually, all the pioneers took their turn in that upstairs bedroom apartment, as did many of the incoming students later on. The faculty voted themselves a stipend of $13 a month. That would be roughly $300 a month in today's currency. Ten years later, they'd go on to record to say, go on record to say that they were richly blessed to still be getting their $13 a month. And that, in spite of the fact that the effective buying power had shrunk by almost 20%. Well, the first year at Madison, they had plenty of corn, and they had some cows, and they had brought some canned fruit with them from EMC. In addition to the staple of cornbread and buttermilk, they had milk toast, chunks of toasted bread in a bath of skimmed milk. For variety, someone introduced Ruis to the diet. Now, Bruis was a delicacy. It consisted of smaller pieces of toast in skim milk. And when the diet seemed monotonous, Ed would remind everyone that the children of Israel ate manna for 40 years. Part of every day was spent in study, part of it in practical activities. The goal was to produce students that were literate and could grow their own food, build their own buildings, and deal with the daily challenges of farm and school and church. And then they could go start their own schools. And many did within the first few years of operation. In 1908, smallpox came to Madison. Dr. Lillian was Percy's new companion, and she reported the situation to the authorities and the campus was quarantined a situation we can well relate to in this era of SARS-CoV-2 and COVID-19. The death rate from smallpox at that time typically hovered around 30%. Eight cases were treated by Mother D and her nurse helpers without the loss of any. And the Nashville medical community took note of the quality of care that was given, the simple remedies that were used and the results. And the sanitarium work began to grow rapidly. Following the pattern of what had been done in Michigan, by 1909, Madison had sent scores of students out into the American South to propagate education and health outreach that had been started on the Madison campus. It was decided to invite those representatives from each of what they were calling units to come back to Madison and share what was going on in their corner of God's work. And the gathering was such a success that they decided to continue the practice every year. By 1910, they'd survived the worst of the growth pains and things were beginning to stabilize a little bit. Ed decided he was going back to school to get a medical degree, the one he'd always wanted. And at the last minute, Percy decided to join him. No sooner had they graduated then the fledgling College of Mal Medical Evangelists, which is now known as Loma Linda University, was calling for Percy's support. Percy didn't want to leave, but he felt the call of the brethren could not be ignored. He left the school that he dearly loved, never to return for more than a short visit. In grief, 
Ed said of Percy's decision, this is like tearing apart bone and marrow. But putting the best face on it that they could, the Madison family said, we're establishing an outpost in California by sending the McGann family. They indeed invested deeply in the College of Medical Evangelists. You remember that Ed Sutherland met Josephine Gatzian when he lived in her home canvassing before college? Well, after spending some time in California helping Ellen White get the medical work off the ground there, including helping to fund the original purchase of the Paradise Valley Sanitarium, she moved to Madison and made Madison her home. In fact, her home at Madison housed the first patients for what was to become the sanitarium, and she provided the means for the construction of several campus buildings, living at Madison until her death. About the time Percy left, Lida Funk Scott, an heiress to the Funk and Wagnalls Encyclopedia fortune, came. After spending some time at Battle Creek, she thought she'd like to visit Madison that she'd been hearing about, and she liked what she saw and she stayed, adopting the simple lifestyle of the Madison team as her own. Lida Scott poured her inheritance into the development of ministries like Madison and Loma Linda. Her personal ministry was to encourage the units that were springing up from Madison all over the South. She encouraged them with her presence, with her advice, and with her means. And in 1927, she established the Layman's Foundation to hold the properties and to continue on her ministry of encouragement. God's blessing on the efforts of Ed Sutherland and the team working with him were readily apparent. When in the midst of the Great Depression, a survey from the Department of Education asked how many graduates were receiving public assistance, the shocking response was none. Students had been well-trained to be self-supporting. The Madison College gained world renown when an article about it was republished in the Reader's Digest. And as a result, there were over 5,000 applications from prospective students. Hearing about it, the First Lady of the United States, when she visited Nashville, asked for an interview with one of the staff from Madison. And Floyd Brillard came and wrote later about the experience. Excuse me, the First Lady wrote about the experience in her nationwide syndicated newspaper column, My Day. She tacitly was soliciting support for the housing accommodation needs of all those new students. And while most blessings were systematic, you could see they were the results of a lot of hard work. There were also those miraculous events, like during the, the severe drought of 1943. In response to sincere, unified, persistent prayer, God saw fit to send rain that only fell on Neely's Bend. It was a couple of more weeks before the surrounding areas saw any rain. The Lehman Foundation that had been created by Lida Funk, Lida Funk Scott, was primarily functioning as a holding company. And so in order to provide a better support structure for the educational units, it in turn launched an educational association to continue much of the work of supporting the educational units that Lida Scott had begun. ISEI's mission is to encourage its member schools and others to continue to operate on those principles that Ed Sutherland had learned through his many and varied experiences. Madison was established to train young people in their relationship to God, their intellectual potential, and in practical skills for service for others so that they could in turn go and start similar schools, clinics, and institutions, spreading the gospel wherever they planted them. And several of those units still exist today. Many of them exist within the organized church, and others continue with the self-supporting model, relieving the organized work of the financial responsibility while moving the mission of the church forward in the training of workers. Many of these units are now members of the ISEI Education Association, which continues to grow both domestically and internationally. And you might also remember that by 1909, Madison had sent scores of students into the South, propagating that education and health outreach that had begun on the Madison campus. 
it was decided to invite those representatives back to Madison and share what was going on in their corner of God's work. It was such a success, as we said, that they resolved to continue it every year. And this picture is from 1928. Ed is in the center with his arms crossed and Josephine Gatzian is seated in the middle. Well, the units are still getting together. By 1947, there was such a, a significant self-supporting work that a more formal communication channel between the lay ministries and the organized church was needed. And with the help of Ed Sutherland, ASI was born. In the 1980s, the organization was opened up to professional individuals in addition to organizational members. And ASI continues to get together every year reporting how God has been leading and blessing in all of the units. Even COVID couldn't keep us apart this year as we mark our first virtual conference. Members and action reports have been going on for more than 110 years. And many of you astute attendees might have noticed that this particular seminar track is the OCI track. And we haven't mentioned OCI yet? Well, since 1983, Outpost Centers International has also been taking up much of the work of Lyda Scott's work of encouraging the units, particularly administratively, as they facilitate the growth of the self-supporting work, especially the work of rural-based, urban-focused ministries, outposts. OCI helps those organizations to network, to develop existing projects, and to train and strengthen leaders of new ones. And so now I'm going to try and tie up a little bit of the thoughts that we've had. From one of Mother White's letters, you will become abler and more efficient by every encounter with difficulties and every blast of adversity, for those are God's chosen instruments his methods of discipline and his own appointed conditions of success and victory. Now I'm gonna to have to admit to you, that wouldn't be my chosen instrument, but they are God's chosen instruments. And Ed and Percy certainly had had their difficulty and adversity, but look at the legacy that they've left behind. I believe that Ed and Percy learned to look to God and allowed the Holy Spirit to significantly removed self from consideration that left them with awe. An awe from which they sought to do nothing to give glory to God. And God was able to use that commitment. Indeed, the world took notice when these men who had been awestruck by God allowed his spirit to render selfless service through them in their fields of service, first Madison and also Loma Linda. And when we look to God and allow the Holy Spirit to remove self from consideration, we will be left with nothing but awe. And God will be able to use that resulting commitment as he did with Abraham and with Joseph, with Moses and with David, with Elijah, with Daniel, with Ed and with Percy to minister to fallen humanity and to preserve a knowledge of salvation in the earth. The world will take notice again, as those who have been awestruck by God allow his spirit to render selfless service through them in any circumstance and in every field of service. May God grant to us to have that kind of awestruck experience with him. I'd like to take a moment and close the presentation proper with prayer, and then I've been asked to keep the session open for any questions that you might have. Would you pray with me? Father in heaven, we thank you for the stories of great men. We find so many of them in your inspired word, but great men didn't stop functioning at the guidance of your spirit in biblical times. And we thank you for the story of Ed Sutherland and Percy McGann and the team that worked with them to move supporting ministry work forward so rapidly and so effectively. 
And we're asking that you would help us to have the same kind of vision that they had, that when we see you, we will be awestruck. And being immersed in that awe, that we will be instruments in your spirit's hands to move your work forward to your soon coming. So thank you for hearing the, the desire that you've placed in us. We're asking this favor in the name of Jesus. Amen. Okay. Well, thank you so much. We really appreciate the presentation. I'm always so encouraged to see the way that our pioneers were faithful and the work that God could do through them. And um, I was very blessed by your presentation. Thank you. A pleasure to be here with you. Thank you so much for the opportunity. And um, unfortunately, there was a little bit of a technical issue in that um, I saw the question, well, I saw some comments on the screen, and then when I refreshed my page, I could no longer see them. So I don't think any questions were submitted. If there are any, feel free to type those in again. Um, I do believe the polls worked, um, thankfully, so that's good. <laughs> and the presentation worked perfectly fine. So we're very happy um, that we were able to join you. And so I'll just glance again and see if there's any other questions that came in. I'm not seeing any at the moment. I do see one that says, how okay. many hours of study and work? Um, and also if we have any information about Madison's schedules. I think they're kind of related questions. Uh, in my research, the day was roughly split so that approximately half of the time would be spent in study and approximately half of the time in practical labor. Uh, the practical labor served a number of purposes. It served the purpose of making practical men and women of the students. It also served the purpose of developing the campus at a significantly reduced labor cost, while at the same time providing the students an opportunity to be able to pay their educational expenses. Uh, we don't have a firm or clear statement of the number of hours that an individual spent in each area that I know of, uh, it might be possible to go into some time records that we have archived at the Lehman Foundation. I have not done that kind of historical work. But what we have been told from the pen of Mother White is that education should be well-rounded. And well-rounded might vary from person to person. Someone who's been spending a significant time in academic pursuit might need to spend more time in practical activities, whereas someone who's been spending most of their lifetime in practical pursuits might need extra time in academics to round out their education. In general, the time was about split, as I understand it from my research. Thank you so much for answering that question. I think that uh... It is so important to have a balance there. And uh, even once we're in the work, um, you know, when we're working, um, sometimes we might find ourselves doing more brain work. It's important to take some time to do practical work as well. Um, so I think that's excellent uh, advice that we've been given. Appreciate you sharing that. There's no more questions for now. Um, I'm glad that we were able to answer that one. Well, thank you again for the opportunity to share with you. It's not very open, very often that I get to close a meeting early. My wife calls me the amplified version <laughs> and I tend to run over, but uh, it's been a pleasure to share with you some of the research that I've done on Ed Sutherland. And I hope you've been as much inspired by his life as I have been. It was very well presented. We really appreciate it. Uh, the accents were an extra touch that made it very interesting as well as your graphics. So we thank you so much for presenting and I'm, I trust that each person was blessed and most of all inspired for um, serving as did Ed Sutherland and the people that worked with him.